I am Laszlo Lorand. I am an emeritus professor at Northwestern University, uh, lately from the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology at the Medical School. And um, I am an old Woods Holer. I have many ties uh, to this place. First of all, I was brought here by Albert St. Georgi, who was my mentor in Hungary. And first he invited me here to, to his home in 1952 Christmas out in Penzance, and then uh, he wanted me to come here for the summer. Originally, I came over from England only for a single year fellowship in Detroit, and uh, then a fateful event happened in 1953. I sat down in the old mess hall across my wife, my future wife, who was a beautiful and very bright scientist from Iowa, working with her professor, Emil Vichy. He was a distinguished endocrinologist. Joyce was a brilliant scientist of her own right. Unfortunately, I have to refer to her as my late wife because um, she died about three and a half years ago. But she loved Woods Hole just as much as I do. And uh, we raised our daughter every summer here. Uh, and our grandchildren, Lillian and Sam, they both went to the Children's School of Science. It was a wonderful atmosphere. And um, so Joyce and I got married that year in November. The first summer, 1953, was obviously a fateful one for me because I met Joyce Brunner. And um, um, I remember the Sunday evening musicals in the MBL club. Teddy Shadlovsky from the Rockford University organized those, and uh, scientists were playing music. It was one of the lovely events. And Joyce was very happy because uh, she got reacquainted with her graduate school colleagues like Shelley Siegel, who later became president of MBL, not president, but chairman of the board. Um, so we worked here every summer since 1953, except maybe three summers when I gave lectures in Europe or some other engagements. The most um, memorable uh, scientific events were the um, physiology lectures in the morning in the old lecture hall, um, roughly where the Loeb building is now. And this was the period when chemists and physicists were breaking into biology and they really revolutionized uh, biology as we knew it at that time. I myself had a good background in physics, even though I finished medical school in Hungary. Uh, so I tended towards basic sciences, and um, that's what I pursued in England, where I got a PhD in Leeds uh, with my mentor, uh, 
William Asbury, who was a fellow of the Royal Society. In 1962, we built a house on Wilson Road, on MBL land, and we have lived there ever since. As I said, we came here every summer except maybe three summers. Uh, major events in the early days were the physiology course, and um, I have some wonderful memories. Um, for example, when Albert St. Georgie was lecturing on useful energy and useless energy as far as muscle contraction was concerned. They asked Irving Klotz, one of my future colleagues, to uh, make comments. And um, he got up and he said, the trouble is that Prof, who everybody called Albi Prof, Prof speaks Hungarian and I only speak Yiddish. Um, that brought forth a laughter. Once I was sitting next to Otto Levy, who was another Nobel Prize winner, very little recognized now at the MBL. He got the Nobel Prize for uh, having discovered Vagus Stoff which is the transmitter to the heart, now recognized as acetylcholine. And he was an old man, very difficult of breathing. He had emphysema. He was a heavy smoker when he was younger. And I only got to know him later in life. But every summer, because I was one of the privileged few who was his friend's uh, protege, uh, he gave me half an hour audience, whether he was rocking on, in a rocking chair on the porch of the mess hall or whether uh, um, uh, the audience was at Stony Beach. He always gave me a bit of wisdom. And if you are interested, I can uh, quote a few comments that he made. Yeah. Um, during a Halbrun lecture in the physiology course, actually Halbrun turned out to be right because uh, Victor Halbrun was a bit of a preacher, and uh, he was gathering all sorts of evidence that calcium was the motive force, the immediate, uh, the immediate uh, signal for muscle contraction, and very few people believed him. He turned out to be absolutely correct, even though the evidence was very weak. In fact, it was probably only Halbrun who could dream up that explanation from those experiments. Otto Levy pushed me in my ribs with his elbow and uh, perhaps facetious, facetiously, he said, Laurent, calcium is alles. Calcium is everything. Well, Harbin seems to have prophesied correctly. Otto Levy um, was a lovely man. After fleeing from Graz on the border of Austria and Hungary, um, he came to NYU Medical School as an honorary professor of pharmacology and um, came here for the summer. Once we were peeing together in the men's room before a Friday evening lecture, and he said, uh, Laurent, uh, an empty bladder is more important than a full mind. <laughs> <laughs> 
before a lecture. So I inculcated this wisdom to my daughter and grandchildren before exams, and they are very grateful for it. Shortly before the full force of the 1954 hurricane um, hit Woods Hole, Otto Levy, who was trying to get up to his library desk, was pushing the button furiously in the basement to get the elevator that would not come because electricity was already cut. So I drove my car, a fancy Studebaker, to the back door and essentially picked him up and put him in my car and drove him to his home on higher grounds. There was a house um, just at the west end of, um, of the Loeb building. There was a hill there, so I just deposited him there at home. Um, and his wife was anxiously waiting for him. So these are my memories of Otto Levy. Fifty-four, that was um, a memorable year because that was the summer when Jim Watson and Francis Crick were roaming the streets here. Jim Watson lived in Albert's um, beach cottage. Whenever he went to the main house, uh, he brought in lots of sand on his feet. And Marta, who was the lovely wife uh, of Albert, uh, gathered all the sand that Wat Watson brought put it in an envelope and put it in his mailbox. In 54, there was this surprise party that Gamov, actually, I think it was Gamov who really rented or owned. Albert didn't rent, but he would give his MBL cottage to the uh, uh, famous visitors. George Gamov was very interesting Russian expatriate, um, one of the top physicists who drove into uh, Woods Hole in an open car, a Leda. It was red and white seats, leather seats, and was holding a gin bottle in his left hand, holding it out. And he said, hurrah, when he arrived in Woods Hole. He ended up in Albis Cottage, and he arranged a surprise party for Jim Watson and Francis Crick. That was one of the wildest parties Joyce and I attended. I do have a picture of Gamov and Joyce. Gamov lectured to whoever he could find. And at that party, he arranged dancing till midnight or beyond. People were pretty inebriated by that time. Of course, the most significant thing, as I said, was that I found my uh, lifelong partner here, and um, her ashes are buried here. And she was also my co-worker for many years. We published about 15 
fairly significant papers uh, which had its origin in Woods Hole. Um, and Woods Hole had a tremendous influence as I look back in my own development. I was offered a job at Northwestern University because of my friendship here in Woods Hole with Irving Klotz, which also developed a li into a lifelong close friendship until he died some 10 years ago. The dean, I mean the chairman of the department came to interview me here and next fall I was invited to give a lecture and by the following spring, which happened to coincide when my daughter was born and um, uh, I was offered a job to build up biochemistry and I took advantage of my uh, friendships and, uh, and uh, networking here in Woods Hole. It was really a scientific marketplace so uh, eventually, I managed to recruit Bob Goldman, who is a distinguished scientist, uh, to become chairman of the Cell and Molecular Biology Department. That was some 25, 30 years ago. That was a Woods Hole connection. And then, Klotz and I recruited David Shemin, who was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, to uh, come to Northwestern here in Woods Hole. Uh, we persuaded him of all the potential that he would build up a department. Eventually, we built up a department where we had including myself, six members of the National Academy. So, uh, <laughs> Woodsall had an infinite uh, influence that keeps on giving at, and cascading. I brought distinguished scientists to Woodsall, uh, Gustav Born, a fellow of the Royal Society, came here for one summer to work with me. He was chairman of pharmacology in Cambridge. In my own field of hemostasis and blood coagulation, I um, managed to make a significant discovery we dug Doolittle, uh, showing that the inhibitors that we discovered at Northwestern to inhibit only the last stage of human blood clotting would inhibit the entire process of coagulation in lobster. So we immediately knew that the lobster clotting must have been what you might call the primitive precursor of the complex system that vertebrates employ or evolved with many steps of controls and regulation. In the lobster system, there is only one enzyme that's released from the hemocytes and clots the fibrinogen. And we were able to inhibit that step. Actually, this showed that evolution produced two different paths to the clotting of fibrinogen. Was, one was a simple one, so a single step 
of taking a protein, modifying it to form a clot. Whereas the human blood clotting system, as we worked it out, is far more complicated. This system was useful, so even in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, we managed to describe a patient who was bleeding, whose serum would inhibit lobster clotting. So we used the lobster system as a diagnostic tool to diagnose a severely ill, severely bleeding individual. Well, Albert St. Georgie, even disregarding his Nobel Prize, was a unique person. I knew him from Hungary. In fact, he invited me to his department as a fourth-year medical student or third-year medical student. And we had a kitchen there where they cooked for us. This was in the post-war era. And uh, this was no joke because there was starvation, you know, and uh, difficult times. And uh, my mother had uh, uh, what, what happened was that Marta allowed me to take food home for my mother, so I always got double portion. And uh, I had a food carrier like you have in China, dishes stacked, pots stacked on top of each other. And every evening I took it home to my mother and that was her evening meal or next day's food. And um, so I knew Albert uh, as a caring individual and I also knew that he was um, um, a leader of a uh, opposition to the Nazis. In fact, the Nazis were looking for him. He went into hiding. Uh, his life was in danger because he carried a secret message to Felix Horowitz, who was a refugee from uh, Czechoslovakia in Turkey. And Albert showed up. He was his friend from Czechoslovakia. And Albert showed up in Turkey and said, would you set up a lecture for me? So the Germans got wind of this, and somehow the message got into the hands of the Gestapo. The message, of course, was that Admiral Horthy, who led up to the Nazi era in Hungary for 20, 25 years, uh, got frightened, got cold feet at the end, and he wanted to communicate with the Allies that the Hungarian army wouldn't fight them if they came up on the Balkan. Of course, that whole thing was a disinformation by Churchill. He was trying to fool the Germans that he would come up on the Balkan. But, of course, he had plans to come up on Sicily and Italy instead of the Balkans. Nevertheless, the Gestapo, when they finally arrested Horthy and uh, took over Hungary, and they started deportations in '44. Then they started looking for Albert. And Albert was very outspoken in Hungary against uh, the military and the Germany and that sort of thing. He didn't keep his mouth shut. And they were looking for him. 
So uh, I knew Albert's history and um, uh, was a very good relation I had with him. He liked me. He helped me to go to England. Still had influence in Hungary because he was the president of the Soviet Hungarian Friendship Society, which was an honorary role. And um, uh, he arranged a passport for me so I could still leave legally for England at the end of 1948. Um, here he had a nice life. Woodsall was ideal for his personality. He had many jobs offered from universities, but he didn't want to tie himself down to teaching. If you are looking for, uh, how shall I say, similar individuals, maybe Picasso would be completely restless, just like Picasso's hands were moving continuously. It didn't matter whether he was painting or doing sculpting or, or ceramics or whatever. He had to move continuously. Albert was a similar personality and uh, he dearly uh, cared about mankind as a whole. So he kept writing against, if you read his books, against atomic war and friendship in Europe. And he would be happy with the European Union ideas and United Nations ideas would appeal to him and did appeal to him. But Albert's muscle research up to the 1960s was very successful here. He introduced the glycerinated muscle. I'm sure there are stories that you heard about it, which was an important model which one could use. I used it for high school kids to demonstrate that the ATP addition would contract and exert force by contraction in a glycerin-preserved piece of rabbit muscle. Um, the, um, so up till late 1960s, I would say, he was, he was a delightful individual collected all the famous names. They came to his house, they lived there. He introduced us to those people and uh, we all benefited from it. As I mentioned, George Gamow, but there was Fritz Lippmann, there was uh, uh, Herman Kalkar. It was, it was a, a wonderful, quiet place for lectures and uh, meetings and uh, beach parties. I, I went sailing with him. I went fishing with him. He really went into everything with full energy. We used to swim around the Penzance Point. Of course, you could do that only with appropriate knowledge of the tides. His wife, Marta, would consult with uh, uh, the owner of the uh, food boy at the time. Uh, forgot his name, it was a Greek guy and uh, he knew all the tides. And then we would get in the water on Buzzards Bay side and swim around the point and wait for the tide or hoping that the tide would coincide with our arrival in the hole. 
and then the tide would push us in first in the hole and then you have to swim for the gut and we came out on the great harbor side wet and that was about a half an hour to 45 minute trip. Um, Steve Kuffler, who was one of the <coughs> almost Nobel Prize winners here in Woodsall, he died during the summer before the fall, he would have got the Nobel Prize. Two of his students, when two of his students got it. Um, Steve Kuffler worked here as a famous neuroscientist for many years, and his house is just opposite Stony Beach. Um, he was part of our group, also of Hungarian extraction. Um, St. Georgi was interested in everything. He retained his childlike curiosity, which is really, I think, an essential part of, you might say, greatness, with a little bit of luck. It's not enough to be a good scientist. You've got to uh, have luck. And if I may quote another Otto Levy wisdom, Pearl of Wisdom, he was telling me the story when one young doctor was seeking to become assistant in his lab in Graz in Austria. And um, he sort of paraded what he could do, all the complex operation on animals. He could cannulate the bile duct, he could cannulate the pancreatic duct. These are very tiny ducts. And he goes on and on and on. And Otto Levy was just listening and at the end he said yes my young man but are you lucky <laughs> so with that i finished